All right, um, welcome back to the Spinal Cord Injury uh, Clinical Lecture Series. Today our discussion is gonna be on uh, sexuality and reproductive health after spinal cord injury. Um, I approach this topic with fear and trepidation uh, because um, I think when patients come to see us as clinicians, they expect us to know everything. And this is one of those areas where I think all of us have just a little bit of discomfort uh, as, as we move forward. So um, bear with me, feel free to um, ask questions as I'm going through. Uh, you can do that by chat um, or uh, raising your hand. I'll try to get back to you as, as we proceed. And I'm stuck. There we go. So uh, briefly, we'll talk about normal sexuality and then discuss uh, the factors that contribute to dysfunction after spinal cord injury. Um, obviously, folks want to know about treatment strategies and what interventions are available for both men and women. So uh, we'll spend some time going through those uh, things as well. So definitions of sexuality. Uh, used to seem simple, and, and I think that um, as our society has progressed, uh, we've had to take a broader look at what sexuality means. It's a central aspect of being human. It encompasses much more than sex, however. It includes gender identities and roles, um, includes sexual orientation, eroticism, pleasure, intimacy, and reproduction. Um, a number of things contribute to uh, how we think about those things, including biological, psychological, social, economic, political, cultural, ethical, legal, historical, religious, and spiritual factors. So all of those are, are going to play a role as we move through this. Most uh, folks don't expect that they will gain a spinal cord injury, and so when it happens, um, obviously it can be very traumatic. Um, and recovering or regaining uh, feelings of uh, sexuality and intimacy is, is very, very difficult. Mitchell Tepper uh, was a gentleman who um, sustained a spinal cord injury um, just as he was starting college. Um, he ultimately ended up with a C7 incomplete uh, spinal cord injury um, and uh, went forward to do his research um, on uh, sexuality and intimacy after spinal cord injury. Um, this is uh, a book that he has put together, uh, includes some of the information from his dissertation. I think his quotes are especially relevant. The secret to great sex lies more in the state of your mind than in the state of your body, in the feeling of your heart more than in the feeling of your genitals, and in the quality of the connection more than in the quality of the erection. Um, he has uh, put forward several uh, additional publications, um, and um, these are shared nationally as well as internationally uh, with folks who are trying to recover sexuality and intimacy after a spinal cord injury. We know that uh, this, in fact, is one of the highest priorities for persons with, uh, living with a spinal cord injury. Um, Kim Anderson reported back in 2004 in a uh, survey that included all of these potential functions. Um, and among these, uh, the survey uh, asked, which is most important to you? If you could regain one function, what would it be? Um, and short of uh, tetraplegia, who uh, all of them would prefer to have arm and hand function first and foremost, um, the majority of folks indicated that sexual function is something that they would like to uh, be able to regain, if at all possible. Um, so we're going to talk through a little bit of uh, upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron uh, lesions. We know that upper motor neuron uh, injuries occur within the central nervous system um, and that damage uh, proximal to the anterior horn cell will typically result in um, basically a, a spastic paralysis. Um, whereas a lower motor neuron is damaging the peripheral nervous system uh, somewhere distal to the anterior horn. Um, and so uh, in that case, you end up having a flaccid paralysis below the level of the injury. Um, depending upon what was involved exactly, uh, that may mean that you've lost um, 
all of the reflexes associated with uh, sexual function. So we'll, we'll talk through that a little bit more as we go through. So as a reminder, back uh, in utero, as we are developing, um, we all start off with very similar uh, structures, um, both men and women. Um, men, uh, because of their XY chromosomes, um, have Leydig cells that produce in utero somewhere around eight weeks uh, during the development. Um, Leydig cells uh, begin to produce testosterone and the Sertoli cells produce anti-malarian hormone. Um, subsequently, what happens with that is the uh, Wolfian ducts persist, whereas the malarian ducts dissolve. On the female, um, on the other hand, they don't have Leydig cells or Sertoli cells. Um, and so in the female, malarian ducts will persist and the Wolfian ducts will dissolve uh, since there, there's no testosterone to be able to maintain them. Uh, subsequently, the um, uh, gonads, uh, the ovaries in the women and the testes in the men are connected to other structures uh, that continue to develop. The uh, ep epididymis, the vas deferens and seminal vesicles, um, the scrotum uh, contains the testes uh, for the men, whereas the women have uh, reaching out from the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, uterus, cervix, and vagina. Um, Instead of the scrotum, uh, the women will have labia majora minora, and then um, the men will have the penile shaft and the glans penis, whereas the women will have the clitoris. And, and so these are the homologous structures between men and women as we talk through those. Not surprisingly, the innervation um, is gonna be very similar for both men and women as we look through the system. So the somatic nervous system, that in which we have voluntary control uh, uh, includes the pudendal nerve coming off of S2 through S4, um, and that uh, is gonna innervate the pelvic floor musculature um, and provides afferent in influences from T4 to S4, all of which can uh, contribute to sexual arousal. Um, the parasympathetic nervous system, part of the autonomic nervous system, um, is uh, managed through the pelvic nerve, uh, S2 through S5, and this is uh, what mediates the reflexogenic arousal. Uh, so in order for that to occur, you need to have afferent as well as efferent loops, uh, S2 through S5, that are intact. Um, whereas the sympathetic nervous system, the other part of the autonomic nervous system, remember arises from the thoracolumbar lumbar regions of the cord, um, Sympathetic influence to the uh, genitals um, is mediated through the hypogastric nerve, which uh, includes uh, nerve roots from T10 through L2, and this is what mediates psychogenic arousal. This assumes, however, that the central nervous system above that point uh, remains intact. Um, so we're gonna talk through a little bit more about the differences between the psychogenic arousal and the reflexogenic arousal. Um, a little bit later in the talk. Supraspinal arousal. Uh, so this is what's going on typically um, because of uh, erotic stimuli, and that can be visual, it can be oral, uh, meaning hearing, uh, it can be uh, through sense of smell, through uh, in some cases taste, touch, uh, through the erogenous zones, and through certain types of behavior. We we, we call it proceptive behavior, uh, which includes courtship, flirting, and foreplay. Um, the uh, erogenous zones, um, generally speaking, are listed out for both uh, males and females, um, and, and then uh, both genders uh, may respond to stimuli in erogenous zones uh, that include the nipples, the lips, the tongue, earlobes, anus, buttocks, inner thighs, the posterior knees in some cases, the soles of the feet, the center of the back, eyebrows, and yes, even the teeth. Um, now, uh, what we've learned over, over the years is that it's not so much a male thing or a female thing, it's, it's really up to individual and their, their past experiences and, and their sensory input. Um, but generally speaking, we talk about these erogenous zones uh, that can contribute to the sexual response cycle. 
Now this is uh, a typical sexual response cycle, um, uh, recognizing that on this side, we're looking at uh, excitement, plateau, orgasm, and then ultimately resolution uh, as we're coming through that. We have the females on the lower part of the graph and the males on the upper part of the graph. And I'm gonna kind of talk through uh, these, um, these different uh, levels. So uh, as, uh, as afferent information uh, or, or psychogenic information, so thoughts and or feelings, sensations uh, increase, uh, sexual excitement will increase for both men and women. Um, Interestingly, as you go through the uh, plateau phase in men, and then you end up with orgasm, there is a resolution period that leaves uh, the male refractory for some period of time. And that there's several contributing factors to that, not the least of which is uh, age and, and previous uh, activity. For women, as they go through, uh, they can, um, plateau and, and, and maintain with um, many orgasms, if you will. Uh, they can have a couple of relatively large orgasms without having a refractory period in between, or they may uh, respond very similarly to men. So this, it's, it's variable depending upon, again, uh, circumstances and, and state of mind. So uh, in both men and women, uh, the state of excitement uh, arousal ends up causing um, vascular congestion. Uh, uh, for the men, that's gonna cause erection. For the women, that's gonna cause increased lubrication and engorgement of the clitoris. When a man becomes aroused, arteries leading into the penis open up um, so that uh, the pressurized blood can enter the penis quickly. As it does that, it compresses uh, veins um, on the outer uh, uh, vascular supply of the penile shaft. Um, and subsequently, you end up uh, collecting more and more blood. The penis becomes engorged uh, and uh, ultimately elongates and stiffen. You'll have similar uh, physiology occurring in the clitoris for women. So this excitement phase is mediated primarily through parasympathetic neurotransmitters. So acetylcholine and vasointestinal peptide, uh, both of which promote arterial dilation. We're gonna go into this in a little bit more detail um, as I get further into the talk, but for now, I, I just wanna keep things relatively simple. Uh, both men and women are going to uh, experience um, that uh, parasympathetic uh, transmission. Um, subsequently, the penis will stiffen and harden the clitoris uh, diameter will increase and uh, uh, vasocongestion occurs. For both, we call that tenescence. Um, in, uh, in both uh, circumstances, uh, you end up having um, additional uh, nipple erection, for example. The breasts will swell for both men and women. The testes elevate for the men uh, and pull up closer into uh, the uh, abdominal cavity. Um, both men and women will start to develop the sexual flush across the abdomen, throat, chest, face, and shoulders, um, sometimes arms and thighs. Uh, and, and it's variable, again, between individuals. However, both will also experience increased heart rates, blood pressures, and respiratory rates, and an increased muscular tone throughout the body. The next stage of sexual uh, activity includes the plateau. So again, you're continuing with this, um, but you uh, continue to increase uh, the amount of the sexual flush, the heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rates, and the uh, tone all are going to increase as you go through there. Um, orgasm, uh, if uh, coitus uh, happens, can occur within minutes for men. Uh, with women, usually it takes a little bit longer um, and that may uh, include additional activation of the Grafenberg or G-spot, uh, which is in the vaginal front wall. Um, for uh, men, you have um, 
uh, separate stages. We're going to talk through emission and ejaculation, but for orgasm, we're talking uh, particularly um, ejaculation. Um, and so we'll, we'll go into more details again as I get a little bit further through this. Uh, for the women, uh, they end up having rhythmic uterine contractions, uh, and in part that's uh, in response to oxytocin. Um, both men and women are going to continue to have a, a peak sexual flush. Uh, strong involuntary muscle uh, contractions uh, can occur. Heart rates and blood pressures can uh, uh, almost uh, reach those that you'd find at peak exercise. Um, and then for men, uh, as we move on into a refractory period, they may have a, uh, a period lasting between uh, five and 60 minutes, uh, and sometimes larger, uh, longer than that. Um, resolution uh, occurs for both men and women um, and is uh, somewhat of a uh, mediated through uh, relaxation of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, and uh, again, both men and women generally speaking, will come back down and uh, come to a full, fully relaxed uh, state. So now I want to talk about uh, sexual function after spinal cord injury, or as uh, is often worded, sexual dysfunction. Um, and that can include erectile dysfunction, um, as well as vaginal lubrication dysfunction. Um, it can include ejaculation, which is retrograde or absent uh, in the male. Uh, for both men and women, it could be a reduced or absent orgasm. Their uh, sense of um, sexual being may be diminished, and that can be tied to their self-esteem as well. For men, uh, typically we do talk about infertility, and, and we're going to discuss um, ways that we can get around that. Um, but recognize the, the act of sexual intimacy itself can um, pose problems with regard to positioning. Uh, because of spasticity or contractures. Um, it's very, very important for both uh, men and women that, there be, that they be able to um, maintain continence uh, for bladder and bowel function uh, during the activity and recognize autonomic dysreflexia can occur. Um, <clears throat> sexual function, sexual excitement uh, can be perceived as the body um, as a noxious stimuli below the level of the injury. And we're going to spend some time talking about uh, what, what that looks like um, as we go through this. So treatment. Um, there uh, is physical and psychological um, aspects uh, to sexual dysfunction that we could uh, discuss. The physical, we're going to talk through some of the pharmacological options. Um, as well as the vacuum pump. We'll talk about implants, and then uh, just a little bit on positioning and sexual toys. Psychologically, a rehab counselor or a sexologist uh, may be necessary. A lot of times folks uh, feel more comfortable in peer groups, but sometimes not. Uh, there's an awful lot of material that can be uh, gained online these days, as well as self-help books. So um, the key thing is, as we look at this, we need to look at the whole person, not just the physiology of what's going on. That said, uh, erectile dysfunction after spinal cord injury can include um, aspects that require pharmacological intervention. Um, we'll talk through some different options as well as mechanical uh, aspects and then sur surgical interventions that can be used. So before we do that, I want to talk briefly about uh, the different aspects of erection and then emission and ejaculation. So a psychogenic erection uh, can occur for individuals whose central nervous system, that is brain and cord, are intact through L2 uh, because this includes the hypogastric nerve um, from T10 through L2. Remember, that's a sympathetic mediated response and the person can become aroused because of thoughts, dreams, uh, again, visual, um, sensory, uh, other types of input that will put them into a, uh, a psychogenic uh, state. 
The reflex erection uh, requires an intact pelvic nerve between S2 and S5. And again, this is uh, mediated through the parasympathetic nervous system. So um, on the board exams uh, for the clinicians in the room, you need to understand the, um, the areas that are included and the areas that are excluded uh, for both uh, psychogenic erections as well as reflex uh, erections. An individual who has a, caught a quina injury or a conus injury in some cases, um, where you have either the afferent and or the efferent uh, aspects of the S2 uh, nerve roots affected, um, is not going to be able to gain a reflex erection. Now, for those folks uh, who do uh, gain an erection um, and or for women who have a clitoral engorgement, um, they're still going to go through these aspects in the uh, orgasmic phase, if you will, or the climax phase. Um, for men, we're gonna see emission, uh, and that's sympathetically mediated, again, along the hypogastric nerve uh, that causes seminal vesicles and prostate uh, to contract. You have a release of semen into the urethra, so that's the emission into the urethra. The ejaculation, or the expulsion, however, um, is parasympathetically mediated through the pelvic nerve, uh, again, components of S2 through S5, and you end up having rhythmic contractions of the vulva cavernosis and pelvic floor musculature, uh, stimulated by pedendal nerve uh, influences, and in this scenario, the semen spurts uh, through uh, the urethra. So again, this is uh, discussed in uh, greater detail by Nancy Brackett and her group um, in the publication they put out uh, in 2010 on uh, male fertility after spinal cord injury. So um, as we uh, talk about uh, erection, recognize that we also need to take into consideration the nitric oxide cyclic GMP pathways. Okay, so uh, cyclic uh, GMP is um, cyclic guanosine monophosphate, um, and it is activated by nitric oxide converting guanosine triphosphates to the cyclic GMP. Uh, cyclic GMP uh, acts on smooth muscles of the arterial vessels um, to uh, cause arterial dilation. As the arterioles dilate uh, within the corpus cavernosum, it causes uh, compression of the venous nerves so that uh, blood is essentially trapped uh, in the corpus uh, cavernosum and uh, you sustain an erection. Um, recognize also that a cyclic GMP is broken down to, to uh, GMP uh, by ph phosphodiesterase 5. And so if you were to block this process, you would end up with an accumulation of cyclic GMP and subsequently uh, continue the engorgement process. Um, and this is in fact uh, pharmacologically used to um, optimize an, a male's ability to gain an erection and maintain an erection for some period of time. Um, so again, recognize that as these uh, arteries uh, dilate, the arterioles dilate um, and this engorges, it compresses the uh, the, the um, veins so that essentially you're trapping the blood within the corporal cavernosum as you're going through this. So again, this is described well by uh, Wood and Liu in the New England Journal back in 2000. Um, and it provides the basis for us to use uh, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. So essentially what we are looking to do here is to be able to maintain cyclic GMP and to prevent uh, its conversion to, um, to uh, GMP. Um, and so we use a number of these things uh, to do that. Sildenafil, um, that little blue tablet, uh, about 50 milligrams typically is a starting dose, um, and it will be able to maintain uh, or gain an erection within 30 uh, minutes to, to uh, a couple of hours. Uh, Vardenafil uh, works a little bit differently, but very much the same. 
Um, and it will also uh, allow for up to 240 minutes uh, duration of um, an erection or, uh, or the ability to gain an erection and go back down. Uh, Tadalafil is another preparation that's used, and this one um, will continue to be active for 30 to 36 hours. Um, not that you would maintain an erection during that whole time, but it does make it more likely that you would be able to gain an erection uh, given the appropriate stimuli. So uh, typically you want to dose uh, any of these medications between 30 minutes and four hours prior to the sexual activity, uh, 30 minutes more so for sildenafil, um, and then uh, up to four hours beforehand for particularly tadalafil. Side effects with uh, all of these medications include the potential headache, facial flushing, heartburn, uh, dizziness, and visual disturbances. They talk about a blue haze um, associated with this. Um, these are usually uh, reversible within six hours. Uh, recognize that all of them can contribute to hypotension, um, which our folks are at risk for anyway uh, because of their spinal cord injury. Tadalafil, uh, the one that lasts the longest, uh, also has been associated with back pain and muscle aches, and it's not clear if that's because of increased activity associated with this um, or not, but it is reported in the literature, so be aware of that. When I uh, prescribe these, um, I will also uh, prescribe uh, an alpha adrenergic blocker um, just in case uh, the person has a, an erection uh, that doesn't go down uh, within uh, one to two hours because that could also cause uh, significant scarring over time. You have to recognize that um, you're going to uh, avoid nitrates uh, in this scenario as well. I, you know, I said that wrong. Let me go back to this. You want to avoid the alpha blockers because they will contribute to hypotension. What I do prescribe though in addition is the terbutaline uh, for anybody that I'm going to provide these medications to, um, and it's the terbutaline that could uh, reduce uh, the priapism, that is the maintained uh, erection over time. Um, so in addition to, let me go back for just a moment, in addition to the uh, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, we have the opportunity to provide prostaglandin E, and that would also increase the smooth muscle and subsequently arterial blood flow uh, and uh, dilation within this. Um, so these can be injectables um, uh, such as um, alprostadil uh, that you can actually inject directly into the corporate cavernosum. Um, it's uh, problematic for those folks who are at higher risk for autonomic dysreflexia or those folks who uh, have sensation because it's somewhat uncomfortable. Um, Oftentimes, uh, they will use a, a mix of agents. Uh, so bimix includes phentolamine as well as papaverin. Uh, trimix includes uh, phentolamine, papaverin, uh, and the PGE-1. And then the quad mix, uh, there's four agents now, phentolamine, papaverin, um, the uh, PGE-1, plus the atropine. So again, they typically will use a uh, one milliliter syringe. Um, with a very small 27 to 30 gauge uh, needle. Um, the, the injection itself can, however, cause autonomic dysreflexia. Side effects could uh, include corporal scarring, uh, which we call Peyronie's disease. Um, it can cause bruising, infection, and again, a priapism that can last greater than three hours. Um, so when I uh, prescribe this uh, as with the oral agents. Um, I will also provide terbutaline, five milligrams, uh, uh, at least a couple of tablets so that uh, if priapism occurs, they can use this and it should uh, allow things to relax, hopefully, uh, within uh, 30 to 60 minutes of administration of that medication. If, however, they continue to have priapism, uh, then we do recommend that they go to the emergency department where they can have uh, aspiration of the uh, corporal cavernosum and or injection of phenylephrine. Um, so um, there is another preparation of the alprostadil. Um, 
that is uh, for intraurethral administration. And so again, it's the same uh, type of a scenario, it promotes smooth muscle relaxation and subsequently engorgement. Uh, but instead of injecting, you actually insert this into the urethra. Um, the uh, side effects are similar. Um, recognize that uh, the medication itself, the alprostadil, as I said, can be um, unpleasant. Uh, and so uh, an individual who has incomplete spinal cord injury and is sensate and or their partner um, could experience uh, some of the burning pain associated with this. Um, so the MUSE administration, alprostadil intraurethrally, uh, basically is inserted into the urethra itself. Um, and then as you go through this, you want to try to uh, disseminate um, the medication throughout the shaft of the penis. Um, now, uh, for some individuals, uh, those medications aren't enough. Um, and... Uh, so there are me uh, mechanical interventions that are available. Uh, vacuum constrictor device, basically, uh, this is a pump. Usually it's a hand pump, but depending, it can be a, an electric pump. And essentially what they do is they put one of these O-rings around the base of the penis, um, and then they put this over the penis itself and begin to pump it up. Um, as they go through this, recognize this is going to promote passive engorgement of the penile blood vessels. Um, without the uh, constrictor ring at the base, however, this would go down relatively quickly. Um, one of the problems, well, there are a couple of problems. Um, one is that if you forget to take, to take off the O-ring, uh, then you can continue a, an erection and ultimately cause corporal scarring, as we talked about uh, previously. Um, but the other problem is that uh, proximal to the constrictor ring, you're going to be fairly flaccid. And so you have a fairly floppy, although erect uh, penis. And um, many uh, patients feel like this isn't as good an option uh, for uh, coitus that is direct uh, intercourse. Um, they have similar types of vacuum for uh, women to uh, be able to gain clitoral engorgement, again, very, very similar uh, process. Um, and not surprisingly, um, the great discovery of the age is that, oh, women also like to be aroused and uh, to have these feelings associated with it. Um, surgical interventions, if you've moved through uh, oral agents, they haven't worked, mechanical agents haven't worked. There's the possibility of using um, implanted prosthesis, so a malleable penile rod, uh, such as you're seeing here, essentially um, allows uh, the individual to bend it down or bend it up and it maintains that position. Um, so the, um, the side effect, if you will, of this is that once implanted, you have destroyed the corporate cavernosum and so there will be no chance to um, go back to have um, natural uh, erection as you're going through the process. The inflatable penile pump, um, the IPP, uh, basically looks like the Starship Enterprise, if you will. That actually includes fluid here um, that is uh, um, left with little uh, reservoirs um, that, that are in the abdomen and can be pumped up through uh, placement of this pump in the scrotum, um, and it ultimately will uh, lead to an erection. Um, both of these can erode to the underlying tissues. Um, generally, I've seen more problems with the malleable penile rods than with the inflatable um, penile pump. Um, the uh, inflatable, however, doesn't typically last more than 10 or 12 years. And uh, again, if it stops working, then you would need to replace it. To recognize that again, once you've place this in the corporate cavernosum, uh, you will no longer have an opportunity because uh, you've destroyed the uh, vascular supply uh, that typically would be associated with normal um, erections. Um, I've talked a little bit before about the uh, Brimley implantable stimulators. Um, essentially, this is an anterior sacral root stimulator, and um, this is one of those we talked about. You can have uh, three different options. One option is to stimulate uh, 
contraction of the, the bladder. Um, one is to, another uh, setting is to cause evacuation of the bowel. And then the third setting would be to uh, be able to stimulate uh, penile erection. Um, so again, you have to maintain um, uh, awareness so that you're not pushing the wrong buttons at the wrong time as you go through this. Um, recognize that each of these, when stimulated, could cause autonomic dysreflexia, and so that needs to be uh, continued as a discussion. So as we talk with our, uh, I, I can call them clients or patients, um, but as we talk to our folks who have spinal cord injury and are looking uh, for sexual guidance, um, it's recommended that we use the PLICIT uh, principle. Uh, PLICIT stands for permission, limited information, specific suggestions, intensive therapies, and then you're gonna uh, move forward from the simplest to the most complex depending upon what the person's, person's um, uh, questions are and, and how much information they need. Um, typically the physician is going to provide most of the education uh, for these upper components, although um, we're certainly gonna involve our therapists as we talk about intensive therapies, uh, different types of equipment uh, that can be used, uh, et cetera. The, um, the nice thing about uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation physicians particularly, um, but uh, as well, all spinal cord injury physicians, uh, is we recognize that we work with the team. And so we're going to address, you know, maybe some of the harder questions with regard to anatomy, physiology, comorbidities, and precautions. But we're going to also incorporate um, rehab nursing to talk about bowel and bladder, make sure that skin is going to be safe during sexual activities. Physical therapy uh, can talk to the individual about positioning, equipment, and partnered mobility. Occupational therapists can assist with uh, ADLs and environmental modifications. Recreational therapists can talk about uh, equipment, um, and then the psychologist obviously uh, can provide information about uh, therapy, and then transparency and vulnerability. The, the best scenario is where all of these individuals are working together and communicating effectively uh, between themselves as well as with the patient uh, and or client. So. I'm going to switch gears now and talk a little bit about fertility after spinal cord injury. Um, we are so fortunate uh, here in Miami to have had a group uh, working on uh, fertility after spinal cord injury out of the Miami Project for the past 25 to 30 years. Um, Nancy Brackett, uh, Imad Ibrahim, and Charles Lynn. Uh, the, uh, the first and the last author on this um, have just recently retired. Dr. Ibrahim is uh, still here and is going to continue to assist us uh, as we move forward with our fertility options, uh, particularly for men. And we know that uh, men have about uh, three to four times as, as likelihood to uh, develop a spinal cord injury than women. And so, um, if it seems as if most of our discussion is aimed towards men, that, that's part of the reason. But um, don't worry, I'll get back to talk about women as well uh, as we get towards the end of the presentation. So male infertility uh, could be a result of erectile dysfunction or ejaculatory dysfunction, or it could be because of abnormal semen uh, and the quality of that semen. Uh, female fertility uh, usually isn't a problem and it is uh, not uncommon for women to regain their full menstrual cycle within one to two months after a spinal cord injury. Uh, the family dynamics is something that needs to be considered as well. Um, and again, uh, just recognize uh, that uh, the family structure has changed a lot over the years. Um, and the key thing is that you involve um, those folks that are gonna be involved in the family unit uh, as you talk through this. So it's, uh, it's still a little bit uncomfortable for most folks uh, to go into you know, your hardware store or something like that. Uh, and uh, there are specialty shops now and uh, a lot of uh, things that are available online for individuals. Um, 
We've talked about managing erectile dysfunction and several different options for that, but I want to talk a little bit about ejaculatory dysfunction, uh, the semen quality, and then, and then talk through these uh, treatment options. Um, so uh, retrograde ejaculation occurs almost uh, exclusively with folks with spinal cord injury. Men will actually uh, ejaculate, but unfortunately it is pressed back into, through the urethra and back into the bladder. Uh, the good news is that you can then take the urine uh, after that and spin it down and be able to collect the sperm uh, to be able to do that. The more difficult situation are for those individuals that simply don't ejaculate. Um, I'm going to talk through the different aspects of semen quality in a few minutes uh, as we go through there, but recognize that the treatment options um, basically are going to include the following. Um, again, this was put forward by Nancy Brackett. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim uh, was involved uh, in this publication as well, but basically um, you want to know if the person is going to uh, be able to ejaculate with masturbation. If that's the case, then you've got success and you don't need to go any further. Um, if not, however, then uh, the next step is to consider uh, penile vibratory stimulation. Um, and I'll talk through this uh, in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, as you look at this, recognize that it's relatively safe and inexpensive. Uh, individuals can do this at home once they've had training, um, but they are still going to be at risk for autonomic dysreflexia, and we need to talk through that with them. Um, if uh, they achieve success, then that's great. Um, if not, uh, then it might be that uh, they need to use uh, both dorsal and ventral stimulation in order to uh, be able to gain uh, ejaculation. If that doesn't work, however, then the next uh, likelihood is to go to electroejaculation. Um, it's also relatively safe and close to 100% uh, success, whereas the penile vibratory stimulation um, may be sitting closer to 60% uh, success depending upon level of injury and completeness. Um, so the, uh, the con is that this is a very invasive process, requires specialized equipment and should be done um, in a hospital setting. Um, autonomic dysreflexia almost always occurs in those folks who are at risk. Um, and then finally, if this doesn't work, uh, then the next option would be surgical sperm retrieval, um, which doesn't require specialized equipment, but it's relatively high cost um, and again can cause autonomic dysreflexia. So I keep mentioning that. Um, let's just uh, take a step back and, and recall that autonomic dysreflexia is a massive sympathetic outflow in response to a noxious stimuli below the level of the injury in persons with spinal cord injury, T6 and above. Um, the complications of autonomic dysreflexia can include stroke, seizures, organ failure, and death. Um, and so recognize as we start talking through this possibility of penile uh, vibratory stimulation, um, this is in fact a noxious stimuli below the level of the injury and afferent signals will ascend the cord that be blocked at the level of the spinal cord injury with a reflex sympathetic outflow causing splank and basal constriction and hypertensive crisis. Increased pressure is sensed by baroreceptors that send information to the medulla, which sends information back to the heart and cause this is a relative rate of cardia. Below the level of the injury, however, the person remains vasoconstricted. Above the level of the injury, they vasodilate with flushing and sweating and often uh, experience this pounding headache we associate with autonomic dysreflexia. So again, this uh, can be life-threatening and we need to recognize that it's possible when we are providing noxious stimuli below the level of the injury. So penile vibratory stimulation uh, is an option for folks with upper motor neuron injuries. Um, Again, a uh, success rate uh, for a standard vibrator, about 30% for uh, the Ling vibrator, um, which has a higher amplitude uh, stimulation, about a 70% uh, success rate when you have hip flexor reflexes uh, present. Um, and then uh, with the Perticare, which is the one that's uh, most typically used uh, 
by uh, neurourologists, uh, spinal cord injury physicians for their patients. Um, it'll vary between 30 and almost 100% um, success uh, if the ejaculatory reflex is intact. Again, the amplitude is the critical thing here. Low amplitude uh, is uh, affiliated with uh, low success rate. High amplitude um, could put a person at higher risk for autonomic dysreflexia. You can also augment this, and so by using uh, uh, stimulation to the abdominal musculature, it actually also improves the uh, success rate uh, for ejaculation. Um, before a person tries this at home, we recommend trying it in the office. And again, I'm looking forward to working with Dr. Uh, Ibrahim um, in our uh, clinics at the uh, uh, Christine Lynn uh, Center for Rehabilitation for the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis. Um, ultimately, once uh, we've demonstrated the person is safe uh, in the office setting, then they can take this home uh, for use. Um, it works well for individuals with spinal cord injury above T10, but particularly for those with a bulbar cavernosis reflex that is intact and a hip flexor reflex uh, that is intact. If it doesn't work, however, electroejaculation is uh, next uh, on the tier. Um, so typically this requires a hospital setting. Um, and uh, surprisingly, this will work for both upper motor neuron as well as lower motor neuron injuries. Uh, there is a high risk for autonomic dysreflexia and rectal burns as you go through the process. So a rectal probe is placed. Uh, an assistant will milk the urethra to recover semen as you go through this process. This was a, initially developed uh, uh, by veterinarians um, as they were uh, trying to um, manage uh, breeding, uh, particularly in sheep, but it's also been used in uh, several other species uh, as well. Um, ultimately, what we see in humans, uh, for, for those with a cervical spinal cord injury, about a 60% uh, success rate, uh, thoracic spinal cord injury about 90% and lumbar about 50%. Again, in this scenario, you collect the sperm, wash it and preserve it, and then uh, go through the process of in vitro fertilization. Um, if EEJ is unsuccessful, then uh, the next uh, consideration would be a vas deferens, um, aspiration, and or testicular punch biopsy. Um, so, the other problem associated with spinal cord injury is abnormal semen. Um, and so uh, there have been a number of studies over the years trying to figure out what contributes to this. Um, generally speaking, and the crew here at the Miami Project has done a lot of this research, uh, they've demonstrated that uh, it's actually not an increased temperature uh, within the scrotum for individuals with spinal cord injury versus controls. Um, Bladder management may be something, uh, a contributing factor. Uh, those who use intermittent catheterization protocols uh, have best uh, results, uh, whereas those with indwelling catheters um, have a significantly less um, or less normal uh, semen. Um, it doesn't appear that ejaculation frequency contributes to this, no different in spinal cord injury than able-bodied individuals. The ejaculation method uh, contributes somewhat. So if the person is able to masturbate uh, successfully, their uh, semen quality is better than that uh, that is uh, um, acquired through penile vibratory stimulation, which is better than that um, acquired by uh, electroejaculation. Um, age sense injury doesn't seem to be a factor, surprisingly, with regard to the quality of semen. Um, and although there are certain, uh, certainly uh, abnormal hormonal uh, responses, particularly in men after spinal cord injury, it doesn't appear that those contribute to the abnormal semen. In fact, what Dr. Ibrahim, uh, uh, Dr. Brackett have shown uh, is that the semen uh, contains inflammatory cytokines uh, that uh, um, apparently uh, significantly influence uh, sperm motility. Um, so the hope is that you could actually improve the um, motility of the sperm uh, with neutralization of those inflammatory cytokines. Now, why are those cytokines present? Um, 
it's not real clear, but I wonder if it isn't related as, as so many other aspects of uh, vascular inflammation are related to obesity after spinal cord injury. And that's something that we uh, can take a look at later on. I wanted to finish just a little bit with, we haven't spoken much about women with spinal cord injury. Um, obviously they have all of the same uh, types of uh, psychosocial aspects, um, but recognize that uh, they will remain fertile. Um, and again, can regain, most do regain menses within three to six months after their spinal cord injury. Um, pregnancy uh, typically is managed at high risk uh, centers. Um, there is some literature indicating uh, a, an increase in preterm deliveries and lower birth weight infants. Um, there uh, is more morbidity associated with uh, tetraplegia because of their risk for VTE, um, venous thromboemboli, undiagnosed autonomic dysreflexia, which uh, essentially is a mimic for preeclampsia. Um, so uh, a number of studies have recently come out. This one just came out uh, this year uh, in PM&R, uh, looking at Washington State. Um, they found that about 50% of women required cesarean section, but cautions are what I really want you to be recognizing. For women with spinal cord injury, T6 and above, they should receive epidural anesthesia um, during labor and delivery. Uh, also, keep in mind that the epidural should remain in place until the uterine contractions resolve and nursing has been initiated, recognizing that nursing uh, is also a noxious stimuli of a low level of the injury for women with spinal cord injury above T4. Um, so all of these things uh, should be kept uh, in mind as we go through this. So, um, you know, there are a number of myths and stereotypes, and I hope, uh, hope we've been able to get past those in our society, but um, hope in one hand and spit in the other and see which gets hold first. Um, I think that uh, what we need to do as clinicians um, is to help folks understand the truths. A stiff penis or wet vagina does not make a solid relationship. Inability to move doesn't mean inability to please or to be pleased. Um, the inability to perform does not mean inability to enjoy. Um, also, loss of genital sensation and or function does not mean loss of sexuality. Uh, the largest uh, sexual organ in the body is the brain, and we need to remember that and remind our patients of that. Spinal cord injury may or may not um, change a person's interest in being sexually active. Um, these folks might be uninformed about their function uh, and what is or isn't uh, possible uh, with regard to sexual activity. Um, our folks uh, with spinal cord injury may have gained misinformation and or misconceptions, excuse the pun, um, and or they may have been given negative messages uh, that they don't have a right to be sexual. Um, and uh, we, uh, those of us working with our folks with spinal cord injury, need to do everything that we can to dispel the myths and to help folks understand. So we really need to spend time educating. And this is probably one of the most difficult areas for physicians uh, with spinal cord injury. And again, um, Dr. Brackett, Dr. Ibrahim have uh, put forward surveys uh, in which uh, patients who have a spinal cord injury are asked, did your physician talk to you about sexual activity uh, and fertility options and whatnot? And unfortunately, there's still a large number of individuals um, whose physicians don't feel comfortable or don't, simply don't have the knowledge to be able to assist them. And so hopefully we've got the resources. I know that we have the, the knowledge uh, here at the Miami Project um, and uh, in the uh, Lynn Rehabilitation Center for the Miami Project to cure paralysis. I'm open for questions, although um, I've uh, taken almost all of my allotted time. Um, I would love for input. Uh, you can ask on chat, or, or uh, if you prefer, uh, feel free to go ahead and uh, ask your questions from here.